Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Washington Institute uh, for Near East Policy and to the latest in our counterterrorism lecture series. Uh, today, uh, we are really pleased to have uh, Lou Rohde, the Deputy Assistant Director uh, at the Homeland Security Investigations uh, in uh, the Department of Homeland Security for a conversation about the role that HSI uh, plays in uh, investigating uh, counterterrorism uh, here in the United States. Uh, HSI uh, provides uh, a variety of different roles and functions uh, with some unique capabilities and authorities. And so we're really pleased to be able to have this conversation uh, with Lou today. Lou is currently the Deputy Assistant Director for HSI's National Security Investigations Division, uh, which includes uh, the Counterterrorism and uh, Criminal Exploitation Unit, the Human Rights Violators and War Crimes Unit, and the division's collaboration uh, with FBI's uh, JTTF, uh, Joint Terrorism Task Forces. Uh, prior to joining uh, HSI, uh, Lou uh, completed a distinguished career in the US Navy, which served as an intelligence specialist, a member of SEAL Team 3, and as an agent with uh, NCIS, among other roles. So with no further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Lou. Uh, I just wanna remind that we will be able to take questions today via email. Feel free to send questions to the email address policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org, uh, and we will be able to uh, pose those to Lou during the uh, Q&A that will follow. Lou, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> First and foremost, I would like to thank you for the invitation to be part of the Washington Institute's Counterterrorism Lecture Series. It is an honor to represent Homeland Security Investigations, or HSI, and to speak to you at this esteemed event. Today, I'll be highlighting the significant role that HSI plays in the field of counterterrorism. HSI is the principal investigative arm of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, DHS, responsible for investigating transnational crimes and threats, specifically those criminal organizations that exploit the global infrastructure through which international trade, travel, and finance move. HSI is the investigative component of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, consisting of more than 10,000 employees who are assigned to offices in over 210 cities throughout the U.S. and 80 international offices in 53 countries across the world. HSI disrupts and dismantles global criminal enterprises and terrorist networks that violate the customs and immigration laws of the United States. HSI accomplishes its mission by utilizing its unique and expansive criminal and administrative authorities, strategic law enforcement and non-governmental partnerships, robust international footprint and connectivity, and cutting edge technology and innovation. These efforts uphold border security, protect the homeland, and ensure public safety. HSI supports the global counterterrorism mission through continued participation in the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Forces, or JTTFs. Within the JTTF construct, HSI special agents leverage HSI's unique and wide-ranging authorities to target the people, money, and materials that support terrorist activities. In the most simplest of terms, we investigate, disrupt, and dismantle terrorist, transnational, and other criminal organizations that threaten or seek to exploit the customs and immigration laws of the United States. Following the attack on the World Trade Center in New York City on February 26, 1993, Legacy components of HSI began our partnership on New York's JTTF. Following the attacks on September 11, 2001, Legacy INS partnered with FBI's Counterterrorism Division. For many years, this field and headquarters support consisted of a limited cadre of agents assigned to sporadic JTTF field offices throughout the US and a small element of supporting personnel at HSI headquarters. I am both happy and proud to say that HSI's role in counterterrorism has matured significantly over the years to the level of staffing and support we maintain and continue to grow today. HSI today is charged with the daunting responsibility of executing DHS's number one mission, priority, and objective to prevent terrorist attacks. HSI special agents lead DHS's investigative counterterrorism efforts on the FBI-led JTTF by utilizing our broad range of criminal and administrative authorities to identify, detect, investigate, interdict, prosecute, and remove terrorists and dismantle terrorist organizations. As the largest investigative agency in DHS, HSI special agents assigned to the JTTF are involved in a majority of international terrorism investigations nationwide and lead investigations into international terrorism subjects 
when HSI equities related to immigration or trade-based crime can be utilized in furtherance of the counterterrorism mission. Foreign terrorists need to move money, weapons, and people across international borders to conduct their operations, and HSI holds a unique set of law enforcement tools for disrupting these illicit activities. Outside of the FBI, HSI is the largest and longest standing federal contributor to the JTTFs nationwide. HSI has more than 130 agents assigned full-time or part-time to the JTTFs and well over 200 total personnel assigned to this mission space, including our agents assigned as JTTF liaisons. Although the FBI is the lead agency for counterterrorism investigations, it is imperative to the U.S. government's counterterrorism mission that all agencies engaged in this fight employ a whole of government approach to every problem set. HSI prioritizes coordination and collaboration both within DHS and external partners across the counterterrorism enterprise, and HSI continues to be recognized and valued for its partnership and prominent role in advancing the CT mission. Working closely with the FBI and other partners, HSI provides investigative and operational capabilities to track and mitigate real-time threats quickly and effectively, and provides critical investigative support to a multitude of terrorism investigations every day. These include investigations into financial crimes, intellectual property rights violations, immigration benefit fraud, human rights violators and war crimes, contraband and human smuggling, transborder cyber crimes, counterproliferation of weapons and technology, export enforcement, and all forms of immigration and customs related administrative investigations. Only a few counterterrorism cases culminate with the filing of actual terrorism charges by the JTTF. When terrorism charges are unattainable, HSI is shown to be extremely effective in offering non-traditional disruption options. Utilizing our authorities, we offer strategic and investigative options to mitigate and disrupt threat streams and subjects who pose national security threats to the U.S. both domestically and abroad. If criminal charges cannot be made or an immediate action is needed to stop a terrorist threat, HSI very often utilizes its administrative immigration authorities to take subjects of national security concern off the streets and place them into removal proceedings in lieu of, or in anticipation of, future criminal prosecution. In coordination with our partners, after HSI criminally or, or administratively arrests terrorist subjects or their associates who are foreign nationals, we work to continue to detain these terrorists in federal custody, seek removal of their U.S. status, and ultimately remove them from the United States. We do this in collaboration with ICE's Enforcement and Removal Operations, ERO, and the National Security Law Division, NSLD. HSI Headquarters National Security Investigations Division, or NSID, is responsible for managing HSI's efforts related to counterterrorism and other national security programs. The National Security Unit, NSU, integrates the agency's national security and counterterrorism efforts and synchronizes operational equities, intelligence information, support elements, and policy efforts into a single overarching unit to mitigate and combat threats to national security. NSU is further divided into two counterterrorism sections, CTS, and a training and development section. CTS personnel are fully embedded within the FBI Counterterrorism Division's International Terrorism Operations Section, ITOS, which is the command and control element of the JTTFs. In addition to the field's local daily engagement, from a headquarters level, it is here that ICE and HSI equities and authorities are considered and infused into JTTF field operational objectives and investigative strategies to disrupt threats. HSI is the only agency, federal or otherwise, to have representation at ITOS within every single continental U.S. unit, which provides HSI visibility over the entire threat spectrum. NSU's two counterterrorism sections provide this coverage, which not only supports field ele elements engaged in CT efforts, but also keeps HSI and ICE leadership apprised of current threat streams and investigative developments. HSI personnel are also embedded at agencies within the intelligence community, IC, at Customs and Border Protection's National Targeting Center, and with the Department of Defense to further coordinate our nation's counterterrorism efforts. NSU is made up of subject matter experts on ICE and HSI authorities, capabilities, and CT operations. NSU provides comprehensive administrative oversight and operational coordination and support to all HSI JTTF field personnel, provides outreach, education, and expertise to law enforcement and IC partners, and orchestrates multidisciplinary approaches to terrorism investigations. NSU has developed comprehensive training programs for HSI special agents assigned to the JTTFs 
group supervisors of those agents, and senior level field management, assistant and deputy special agents in charge. Shorter field directed on the job training has also been developed and provided to special agents to provide a crash course in CT investigations from experts in the field where these types of investigations are more prevalent, New York being a prime, prime example. This training has provided field personnel with the requisite knowledge of how to best navigate and operate in a CT environment and has resulted in a substantial increase in the number of HSI-led disruptions, as well as the number of approved significant case reports and CT investigations nationwide. Over 300 HSI personnel have received such training to date and future iterations will be provided as needed. In addition, virtual training courses are under development as a direct result of the current pandemic. NSU also provides complete post-attack coordination in the event of an international terrorist attack. This includes 24 seven support to the investigative response, as well as deployment of personnel and supportive operations. These actions enhance the overall CT response and expedites the rapid flow of critical information between field and headquarters decision-making elements. The most recent example of HSI's post-attack response efforts was displayed on and after December 6, 2019, when Mohammed al shamrani a Saudi Arabian Royal Air Force officer and A2 visa holder, committed a mass shooting on board Naval Air Station Pensacola, Florida, killing three U.S. service members and injuring eight others. HSI personnel from six field offices, as well as personnel from HSI NSID and ICE's NSLD, responded and provided immediate and substantial support to FBI and NCIS throughout the investigation. NSU enacted 24-7 coverage of its personnel, led the coordination of ICE headquarters support to the post-attack response, assumed the lead role for reporting to HSI, ICE, and DHS executive leadership, and coordinated with interdepartmental partners to ensure there was a unified response to the attack. Throughout the investigation, HSI analyzed hundreds of records on A2 visa holders attending training at U.S. military facilities and produced 45 detailed analytic reports on subjects of interest to the field that significantly advanced the terrorism investigation. At the height of the incident, as many as 56 HSI special agents and computer forensic analysts were supporting this terrorist investigation. Unfortunately, similar attacks on the homeland have been all too frequent in recent years, and HSI has played a significant role in the vast majority of them. Our National Security Law Division, NSLD, within ICE, within ICE provides national oversight and litigation support for the Office of the Pr Principal Legal Advisors, or OPLA, litigation of national security cases before the immigration courts, including the development of legal and policy positions and litigation strategy, and the approval of substantive national security charges. NSLD manages thousands of active national security cases, hundreds of which are of interest to the JTTF. At this point, I would like to touch briefly on some trends regarding the changing phases of terror. Post 9-11, the focus of CT was primarily on Al-Qaeda and other established foreign terrorist organizations, or FTOs, whose operations and objectives were directed from afar. Such objectives often involved sophisticated long-term planning and goals, which required long-term intelligence collection efforts with simultaneous criminal investigations on the part of US law enforcement. While our goals have not changed, the playing field did. Circa 2014, with the advent of the so-called Islamic State, or ISIS, our CT efforts had to change with the tactics used by the enemy. ISIS, unlike the FTOs we had been, uh, become accustomed to, were not directing terrorist actions directly, but rather inspiring them. Radicalized Islamists were attempting to support the cause by providing material support, such as equipment and money, by traveling or attempting to travel to conflict zones, or by conducting attacks here in the homeland or in other countries opposed to ISIS. These actions were generally not sophisticated, did not require a lot of money, equipment, or planning, just the motivation and will to support the cause or conduct an attack. For law enforcement, the ultimate goal remains the same, to prevent any attacks on the homeland or U.S. assets worldwide through thorough investigations leading to criminal prosecutions and or administrative enforcement actions, such as removals of the threat. Although the strength and appeal of ISIS has been waning, U.S. law enforcement must remain vigilant and prepared to continue the fight against these and other actors who wish and plan to do us harm. The most current trend has been the uptick in domestic terrorism, or DT, cases nationwide. While HSI's focus is on CT, predicated by FTOs or actions inspired or influenced by them, we do provide support and assistance to the FBI 
on DT investigations through our partnership on the JTTFs. In cases involving international terrorism, our immigration and trade-based authorities are often utilized as the best option to disrupt the threats. In DT cases, however, our equities and authorities are primarily not employed as the best disruption option due to the domestic nature of the crimes. I'd now like to highlight some recent success stories which illustrate HSI and ICE's role in the CT arena. On October 15th of this year, an immigration judge issued a removal order for two Qatar nationals, brothers, for overstaying their tourist visas. Both were arrested by HSI New York as part of the JTTF. The investigation and ultimate arrests by HSI were the result of a JTTF investigation predicated on derogatory information linking them to an overseas terrorist organization. October 8th of this year, HSI Newark, New Jersey, with support from the FBI JTTF, administratively arrested a Bangladeshi national and lawful permanent resident for violations of the Immigration and Nationality, the Immigration and Nationality Act, the word the INA, I'll refer to it as the INA from this point forward, mm -hmm. to include immigrant inadmissible time of entry and fraud or willful mis misrepresentation. The subject was identified as an associate of a suspect in the detonation of a pipe bomb in December 2017 in New York City. On September 29th of this year, HSI New Haven, Connecticut, assisted ERO officers with the removal of an Uzbekis national who had been ordered removed by an immigration judge. HSI identified the subject as being admitted to the U.S. in March of 2006 as a non-immigrant P3 specialty visa authorized to remain in the U.S. until July 2007. In January 2007, the subject filed an I-589 asylum application that was denied and was administratively charged with being an alien present in violation of the INA. In August 2011, the subject was initially ordered removed by an immigration judge, which was upheld by the Board of Immigration Appeals in July of 2014. In December 2017, HSI administratively arrested the subject during an investigation with the FBI on alleged associations with members within the Uzbeki community who sought to travel to Syria in order to fight with the Al-Nusra Front. On August 28, 2020, Mohammed Osman voluntarily departed the United States for Somalia pursuant to a judicial order of removal. This HSI investigation, in coordination with FBI JTTF Tucson, revealed Osman entered the United States by fraudulently obtaining refugee status under a false name and claiming to be a Somali national who fled Somalia based on threats from Al-Shabaab. The subject then coached his wife on the false statements to help them both enter into and defraud the U.S. as refugees. During this investigation, Osman admitted to being a member of and supporting Al-Shabaab and is suspected of previously serving as a bomb maker for the group. Osman was arrested in August 2018 and convicted in April of this year for violations of visa fraud and false statements and sentenced to time served in August 2020. As stated above, he voluntarily departed the U.S. shortly after his release from prison. On January 30th, 2020, HSI Phoenix special agents assigned to the JTTF along with FBI and U.S. Marshals arrested an Iraqi citizen on an extradition warrant issued out of Iraq for the murder of two Iraqi police officers. Immediately following the arrest, HSI served simultaneous search warrants on the subject's residence and place of business related to potential charges of fraud and misuse of visas, permits, and related documents, procurement of citizenship or naturalization unlawfully, and false statements. The subject is believed to be the leader of an Al-Qaeda terrorist cell. The extradition warrant portion of this case is FBI-led, while HSI led the criminal, uh, criminal immigration fraud portion of the investigation. On January 23rd of this year, a citizen and national of Saudi Arabia was arrested outside his home by HSI and FBI special agents assigned to the JTTF. The arrest occurred while the subject was on his way to the Detroit Metro Airport, where he had purchased a one-way ticket to Omaha, Nebraska. The subject, who had entered the U.S. with an F-1 student visa, was arrested for violations of the INA. More specifically, he provided false information and, mis and or misrepresented material facts on his application to enter the U.S. The subject also lied to FBI and HSI special agents during multiple interviews, denying that he had participated in military training provided by Iran. He has been ordered removed by an immigration judge and remains in custody pending his appeal. On June 19, 2019, Hussein Ghul, a Tunisian national, was removed from the U.S. 
The JTTF received information that Google had consistently posted support to ISIS on social media while within the U.S. The ensuing investigation re revealed that Google entered the U.S. as a B-2 tourist visa from Tunisia in 2001. In October of that year, Google entered into a fraudulent marriage and in June 2009 adjusted his immigration status to lawful permanent residence. Google filed an N-400 for his naturalization in December 2014. HSI obtained Google's alien file and identified false statements that he provided on his application related to his association with ISIS. HSI Rally North Carolina coordinated with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services to schedule Google's N-400 interview in February 2017. Following the interview, HSI and FBI agents secured a federal arrest warrant for naturalization fraud. In August 2017, Google appeared for a follow-up interview. He admitted he had posted information on social media in support of ISIS and was subsequently arrested. On August 8, 2018, he pled guilty to federal violations related to naturalization fraud and filing a false tax return. As a result of his plea agreement, Google was sentenced to 24 months in federal prison and agreed to a stipulated judicial order of removal from the U.S. to Tunisia. These are but a few of many, many recent examples, which not only illustrate the role of HSI, but also the partnership involved, not only with the FBI, but with many other agencies as well. I will now switch to some of the challenges faced by HSI and ICE in this critical mission space. Resources. While HSI assigns a large cadre of special agents to the JTTF, we still lack the personnel resources throughout the US to ensure that we maintain full-time representation on every JTTF. This leads to operational gaps in coverage and the very real possibility that our authorities and capabilities may not be considered or employed when they could be to disrupt a threat. In addition, although our headquarters personnel assigned to FBI Counterterrorism Division do an outstanding job maintaining visibility on and supporting a tremendous amount of developing and ongoing CT investigations, it is challenging for our relatively small staff to keep up with the thousands of investigations ongoing throughout the US. Funding. All funding for this critical mission priority comes out of our base funding. There are no special appropriations allocated for HSI CT efforts or for our support to the JTTFs. Our National Security Unit headquarters receives no dedicated funding from DHS, ICE, or HSI to support field counterterrorism operations and investigations and or training, and no such funding to provide our JTTF field personnel with equipment to use in furtherance of their investigations. Legal challenges. Our National Security Law Division and OPLA field attorneys maintain extremely high caseloads and could also benefit significantly from increased staffing. There are also a significant number of loopholes in the law or outdated legal language in the INA which need to be addressed. A notable example is the present loophole in federal firearms law as it relates to aliens admitted to the U.S. on a non-immigrant visa. The exception that has presented the greatest risk to national security and public safety is the hunting license and permit exception, which permits an alien in such status to ship, transport, possess, or receive any firearm or ammunition if that alien has pr procured a valid hunting license or permit anywhere in the U.S. There is no requirement that such non-immigrant possessor use the firearm or ammunition solely for hunting or sporting purposes, but rather this hunting license or permit exception serves as a vehicle for an otherwise prohibited individual to obtain a firearm or ammunition for any purpose. Another notable recurring, reoccurring problem faced by NSLD and the OPLA field locations is the lack of provisions for an attempt to or conspiracy to provide material support for terrorism in the INA. Although there is such a provision for criminal prosecutions, the lack of such language in the INA for charges of inadmissibility or deportability highlights of potential vulnerability in enforcement and removal operations of these alien terrorists. In addition, the grammatic tense of certain subclauses in the security-related grounds of inadmissibility and deportability in the INA can cause issues for NSLD and OPLA field locations in immigration proceedings. The INA renders an alien inadmissible or deportable from the U.S. if the alien, among other things, is a re representative or member of a terrorist organization and endorses, espouses, or persuades others to support terrorism. These subclauses are written in the present tense and do not apply to past conduct. This presents a serious issue for NSLD in the litigation of national security cases in immigration court because these provisions do not apply to affiliation or conduct of the alien prior to his or her arrival in the U.S. For example, 
An alien could testify in immigration court that he renounced his membership in Al-Qaeda before entering the courtroom and is therefore no longer inadmissible based on membership. Opal likely would be unable to prove the renunciation is fraudulent and the ground of inadmissibility, inadmissibility based on current membership would no longer apply. To sum it up and put into perspective our significant role in countering terrorism, HSI represents 3% of the total JTTF workforce. And this workforce is made up of the majority of FBI agents, uh, but it's state and local personnel as well and other federal agencies. HSI represents only 3% of all of that. However, HSI is directly involved in over 89% of all JTTF investigations and HSI leads between 45 to 50% of all JTTF disruptions every year utilizing our exclusive authorities. Without HSI, the disruption of these terrorists would not have been possible. This is a fact recognized and applauded by our partners in advancing the CT mission. HSI and ICE senior leadership fully recognize the significant role that HSI plays in countering terrorism and continues to prioritize and strengthen all of our lines of effort in this critical mission space. Thank you very much. And I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Lou, thank you so much uh, for that uh, presentation. It's a real tour de force. Uh, I'll tell you that since we first sent out the invitation for this event, I've gotten a, a lot of feedback. A bunch of people at DHS have said thank you for uh, giving us an opportunity, but even more so I've heard from your interagency partners uh, who have said, I'm so glad you're doing this event. Not enough people understand uh, the tremendous uh, added value that DHS brings to the JTTS. Allow me to open up uh, with a few uh, questions. I'll take the moderator's prerogative and, and do that. And then we'll open up to questions from the audience. I remind those who are watching that you can submit your questions to the email address policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Policyforum, one word, at washingtoninstitute, one word, dot org. Um, so Lou, you know, as you mentioned um, uh, towards the beginning, you know, uh, Terrorists need to move people, illicit actors need to move people. Uh, and HSI brings to bear uh, unique capabilities when it comes to uh, protecting the border uh, and dealing with uh, people's status uh, here in this country. Um, over the past few years and not just the past four, uh, the question of the place of border security in the larger counterterrorism mission has become a matter of debate. So that we saw the president, for example, tweeting about the issue and the need to shut down the border after the 2017 Halloween attack uh, by uh, Mr. Saipov uh, in, in New York City. But it seems from your presentation that uh, DHS, uh, HSI in particular, really has a handle on this issue. Uh, it has the authorities it needs, uh, is uh, participating in, in every JTTF, uh, funding and personnel constraints notwithstanding. Um, how do you assess the agency's ability to deal with this one slice of the, the counterterrorism uh, challenge, which is to say U.S. border security. Well, I, I do agree with you that we do have a very good handle on the situation. Um, of course, we could always do more with more resources, but with the resources that we do have and provide, um, the only way to defeat this uh, threat is by, you know, combining resources you know, the fact that the, you know, the task force environment is the best way to go. I, I see this in, in almost every type of crime or violation that we pursue or investigate, the JTTF being one of many. Um, this construct this model where, where every agency that participates brings their authorities and unique abilities to bear against the threat is the only way to defeat um, our enemy. And, um, and I think we're doing a, a tremendous job at that. You know, the, the authorities that we bring in these cases, the disruption uh, solutions that we offer uh, to uh, thwart the threat has worked. Um, again, it's hard to you know maintain coverage on each and every single investigation that's out there. But uh, I think we, I think you're right. We're you know do, we're doing our best. We're doing a good job at it. Um, we could always use more resources, um, but. You know, other than that, I think we do have a handle on uh, on the problem. Is it your sense, Lou, that uh, when you do find uh, counterterrorism cases, that we that we have situations where uh, people who were bad actors come into the country for the purpose of doing something, or that 
people are radicalized here in the United States. So there's a little bit of both, right? Some from column A, some from column B. You know, the typical, you know, the old school terrorist networks, Al Qaeda, Hezbollah, um, those types, they typically tended to bring their folks in. Um, but with ISIS, the, the, like I said in, in my presentation, the, the game has changed. Now you have um, people self radicalizing, radicalizing going online, listening to social media, spinning themselves up and, uh, um, you know, wanting to do something for that cause. And it may not require a whole lot of resources, equipment, money. I mean, it's just a matter of getting a knife and go out and kill a bunch of people, you know, in the support of the cause. So, um, you know, we're, we, you know, unfortunately, over the last couple of years, we've seen quite a few of those type of attacks. They continue, um, even though ISIS is on the downswing, so to speak. I mean, those, those attacks still continue. We had an attack uh, December of last year um, at Pensacola. So we just need to remain vigilant and, um, you know, do our best to thwart that threat. I mean, uh, cyber crimes and investigations into cyber crimes to uh, shut down those social networks is, is critical to the fight. Um, but you know, again, um, that's what we're faced today. But yeah, we do see a little bit of both. I mean, um, the ones that we are aware of, you know, we're tracking and uh, the ones that are self radicalized, those are a little bit harder to track at the onset. You know, it's usually you don't find out about them until it's too late, unfortunately. But you know, like I said, the cyber uh, crime investigations uh, are being beefed up. And, uh, you know, we're getting better at uh, identifying these threats before they become you know, uh, an attack. Um, so Lou, one of the um, biggest developments over the past few years in the, the nature of the uh, terrorist threat has been uh, the rise of uh, right-wing extremism, white supremacist groups, uh, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists, REMV, uh, more broadly. And increasingly we're finding that these groups have transnational links as well. These groups travel abroad as well. This has in fact been highlighted in uh, the National Counterterrorism Strategy. Uh, and so we have cases of people from um, extremist groups uh, abroad traveling to the United States, and we have cases of people from the United States traveling abroad. Uh, how big a piece of the HSI um, um, uh, workload uh, is the REMV threat becoming? So, like I stated before in my presentation, uh, DT is primarily um, a domestic crime, considered a domestic crime, and that's solely the purview of the FBI. We participate in, ass in assistance and support through our participation in the JTTF, and when, when we're asked for help, we always give it. We'll never say no, but to be the lead on those types of investigations, because the violations are more of a you know domestic nature it could be a state crime uh, as opposed to you know a, a foreign national being involved or where we could use our immigration uh, authorities or if it, you know trade-based uh, customs related related violations that we can look at if, if they're not there if it's simply you know a matter of a domestic uh, uh, crime and by that, I mean, you know, there are no statutes that apply specifically for domestic terrorism, right? So we have to, uh, if we're going to engage those subjects, we have to find other ways to pr uh, prosecute them, you know, whether if they commit murder or, you know, acts of violence, um, those type of charges. But, um, you know, crossing state or uh, federal lines um, coming in from overseas, when I haven't seen a whole lot of that. Um, in my experience, um, it, like being um, driven, so to speak, from overseas, yes, maybe if some of those folks have traveled, but uh, I, I, I'm not seeing a trend where there's like this international conglomerate of like white supremacists, for example, um, gaining any type of ground and uh, um, joining forces with with like-minded people in other countries to do harm in the United States. I think most of it is, is homegrown and driven here at home. I think it's going to be very interesting to watch and it'd be an area for uh, HSI to be ahead of the curve to think along these lines as uh, these domestic terrorist groups tend to be less organized as groups. And of course, you're right, there is no domestic equivalent of a foreign terrorist organization designation or material support statute. 
but we have already seen cases of Americans traveling <clears throat> to the UK, uh, to Northern European countries, uh, to Ukraine, and of individuals coming here, crossing those borders, those types of travels may well fit, uniquely fit um, the HSI authorities that you've been able to bring to bear in other more traditional uh, international terrorism cases. I'd like to go now to some of the questions we've already received uh, from our viewers. Uh, the first question asks if you could speak uh, please to the role of counterproliferation investigations uh, within uh, the HSI toolkit. So uh, counterproliferation investigations is handled by a different uh, division within HSI. They fall under the purview of our global trade investigations division. Um, you know, they, they merged that about two years ago, the import violations with the export violations, counterproliferation investigations, primarily focusing on export violations. So, um, you know, I don't have a lot to speak on in regards to that, other than the fact that if those type of violations are uncovered in a, in a terrorism investigation, an international terrorism investigation, by our agents on the JTF, they will work those cases. They, the, the agents that we assign to the JTFs will work any investigation that HSI has jurisdiction over. So if a counterproliferation angle becomes prevalent in the uh, JTF investigation, typically those agents will, will, will work the investigation, but coordinate with the local HSI office that does handle that particular uh, type of violation. In most SAC offices across the country, there are specific units dedicated to counterproliferation investigations. So, you know, they would uh, link up with those uh, folks and pursue the investigation generally jointly with, uh, with the CPI groups. Great. So you, you also mentioned uh, investigating financial crimes <clears throat> as part of the toolkit. And I imagine that uh, one area where HSI brings unique uh, tools uh, is in dealing with trade-based crime. Uh, can you speak a little bit to uh, the trend lines uh, that you're seeing uh, and the use of trade-based crime to support terrorist financing, facilitation, or resourcing? Well, again, the um, financial aspect of, of terrorism investigations is, is, is a program that's FBI-led, but we do bring our, you know, tools to that um, mm -hmm to that fight as well in the, in the, in the construct of the JTF. So, you know, it's not that we HSI would take on a terrorism financial financial case, uh, or excuse me, a terrorist financing case independently of the JTF. It's something that we would work in conjunction with the JTF. Um, so a, a broad question, if I may, you know, the Washington Institute, we're in the middle of a, of a study looking at a kind of terrorism review, uh, Part of our presidential transition series. And uh, one of the general themes uh, we're noticing is a desire across political parties, uh, a bipartisan, one of the few bipartisan uh, issues uh, in the counterterrorism area in particular to have agencies do more with less. And, and you, you kind of ended your um, presentation on the um, uh, challenges of budgets and, and personnel. Counterterrorism is no longer the, the number one uh, national security uh, issue. Um, as laid out in our latest national security strategies, uh, it's number five of the top five. Uh, in fact, we typically think or refer to it as a four plus one, you know, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, plus counterterrorism. So uh, how does the department and HSI in particular uh, envision um, uh, the next few years um, as uh, counterterrorism continues to be a primary mission. Um, and of course the terrorists will get a vote, God forbid something succeeds, they'll, they'll suddenly be a lot more attention, but in the interim, I imagine it's not, I'm not the first person to tell you that you should expect to be asked to do, to do more with less. How do you intend to contend with that? Hmm. That's been the story of uh, my experience uh, in the 29 years I've been on the job. We're always asked to do more with, with less. Um, but I, I will tell you this. I mean, starting in when I first got here in the division at headquarters, we had three personnel assigned to, uh, to LX at our, over at ITOS. And this wasn't under this current administration, obviously. This was in 2013. 
And we saw the value of, you know, we need to have greater participation in this uh, mission uh, set, that we need to be involved and we need to have increased participation in the field. So at least from the headquarters level, we've, ever, we've increased our footprint significantly um, since 2013. Like I said, we, when I got here, it was three people. We have over 20 people assigned uh, to the counterterrorism division within the FBI over at ITOS now. Um, we just were, uh, I, I was successful in lobbying for, you know, several additional positions, which were funded, approved and funded. So the problem is not going to go away. Um, it just, it's just a matter of how much dedicated resources we can provide to the field at this point. So here at headquarters, we're, we're fully staffed, ready to go. Um, with whatever threat comes our way. In terms of field level participation, there are gaps we need to fill and we're working on filling those gaps. I don't see this, yeah, even though counterterrorism may be the number five threat, as you, as you mentioned, it's still a threat. I mean, and you know, yes, you may be saying, oh, well, it's not so bad today, but what if there's an attack tomorrow and then the day after and the day after? It's, it's we always have to prepare, be prepared for that what if the unknown, what's coming our way. We just don't know until it happens. You know, and we don't wanna be caught off guard. So, you know, we, were, we will continue coverage of what we have. We will continue to grow. Um, you know, I will continue personally to advocate for additional resources. And, um, you know, I've been pretty successful over the past couple of years of, of getting those resources um, and to, you know, uh, educate our leadership that this is important mission uh, space that we need to be involved. And um, these are the resources that we need, uh, the funding that we require. And, um, you know, slowly but surely, we're, we're getting to where we need to be. So along those lines of looking ahead, where do you see HSI's footprint in the counterterrorism area looking forward over the next, say, five years? I see, um, I see it just continuing to um, pretty much remain the same other than, you know, ideally, I, I mean, I ha I'm not going to give you the numbers, but, you know, I, we, we have done studies on exactly what our needs would be without, you know, um, over overdoing it. And if we can get to those numbers, I think we'll be in a really, really good place. We just, mm -hmm. we just need to have coverage wherever a JTTF has a presence. And when we can fill all those positions, we'll be in a really good place. Let me ask you a, a somewhat sensitive question. Um, I'm former law enforcement myself. Uh, we tend to work uh, really well together across interagency, but it's not without its, its, um, its bumps in the road. Uh, and sometimes uh, within DHS, uh, there's a discomfort with having to follow FBI lead on an FBI-led JTTF. Um, uh, what, what's been your experience about, about working with the FBI in general on, on counterterrorism? How well is that relationship working? I think it's the best it's ever been. Um, I, I don't have, I haven't had or seen any issues working with the FBI in this uh, area. Um, basically in my experience on the job, the only time I've really worked closely with the FBI has been in counterterrorism um, and now with counterintelligence as well. But that's, that's a whole different animal, but, but the, um, but the experience that I've had has been great. I mean, the, the, the level of cooperation on the JTFs is phenomenal. I mean, um, and, and other agencies as well. I mean, I saw it in the field. I, I worked in Los Angeles for 22 years. And when I worked CT cases in Los Angeles, I had an outstanding relationship with my counterparts with the FBI. When I came to headquarters, the same. I mean, it's just been, you know, whatever we ask for, um, from them, they provide. Um, there have not been any significant issues uh, related to, you know, little tits or tap, you know, squabbles. I mean, uh, you know, at, at the executive level, we, we, we get those resolved very quickly if, if they do come up. Um, but generally, no, the, uh, the relationship has been great. I'm so glad to hear it. I'm sure one case that you worked <clears throat> particularly closely with the FBI on was the Al Shamrani case, Pensacola, um, for which uh, that attack was claimed by Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. <clears throat> you mentioned in your presentation that HSI produced, I think you said something like 45 uh, reports uh, based on that. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Um, 
you know, about the, the, without getting into, you know, things you can't talk about in terms of these reports, what types of reports are these? What types of things were you seeing? Do we have a problem of having with, with our mill to mill uh, relationship with uh, how we vet people coming into uh, these training programs? Um, well, to talk a little bit about the reports. So we have a staff of report writers and their job is to, you know, when an attack occurs or in any terrorism investigation, this we call them our subject reports or HSI subject reports. The first thing that we do that's in the find, if, you, if you're looking at a terrorism investigation as find, fix, finish, you know, the DOD acronym, uh, you know, the find phase of the investigation is where we identify the subject. So our staff will start working on subject reports. These can be generated by you know, our knowledge that we uh, obtain at ITOS through you know, the central command, or it could be field generated requests. So field is working a case, they've identified somebody that they need uh, uh, assistance with, they'll send us the, you know, the basic request and we'll, we'll gin up a subject report. These subject reports are very comprehensive. It, it, we go through everything, we put it in an unclassed format with, you know, with a photograph of the subject, you know, all known associates, family members, um, immigration status, primarily travel history. Um, you know, if, if we need to we'll cull through the A file, the immigration file and get information uh, out of that, all that gets put into the report and that's made available to all the partners involved in the investigation. And they're critical, like in times with, I'll give you an example, the Ohio state attack that happened in 2016. Um, our agents were working on the subject report, um, sent it out immediately to the agent in the field, the, uh, one of the uh, attackers or somebody involved was, was deceased. They passed that information. They thought they had killed the attacker. They show the photograph right there on the scene. They had it on their iPhone, showed it to the FBI. It's like, this isn't the guy. So we have to continue, you know, to identify the right person here. So, I mean, those reports are very, very critical in any investigation. And like I said, we make them available and they're quick. And um, you know those go those get uploaded right into FBI systems, so it, so everyone working the case can see them. Very critical in terms of uh, the A2 visa holder problem. So that's a different issue, right? So you have DoD sponsors uh, foreign military students to come into the U.S. to study various um, uh, military tactics training at whatever they provide. They, 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 the problem, well, I wouldn't say problem. The way they bring them here is they bring them in on a two visas, which is kind of a semi diplomatic status of a visa. And so the issue for us in, in, in an investigation like this, or, or it could be in an AWOL investigation where we get a lot of those too. Those folks come here and they realize, Hey, America's the streets are paved with gold. I'm going to stay. Um, and they go AWOL. Um, there's a, a few things need to happen. We need to, first of all, get a, a uh, certificate from DOD saying that, yes, this person is AWOL. Secondly, we need State Department to convey that the person does not have diplomatic status. So then we can take action on that individual, send out a lead to the field to find them and get them. That now that the person is, is formally out of status. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is the first, I believe, uh, an attack carried out by one of the, an A2 visa holder. More likely we're, st we're going to see um, A2s going, uh, foreign military students going AWOL and then trying to track them down. Great. Um, earlier, uh, you mentioned uh, funding challenges. I wonder if uh, if Congress has engaged with HSI leadership to consider specific funding for the CT mission. I don't know if that's specifically addressed. I mean, we bring it up. I, I brought it up personally um, uh, when I talked to staffers, you know, in terms of trying to obtain specific line item funding for this mission set. You know, I agree it needs to happen. Uh, because we do get specific funding for other programs, it would be ideal if we could get specific funding for this program as well. I don't know how far along or if, if that's gained any traction. Um, it, that that's difficult to say. You know, it's hard to gauge Congress, and especially now with the with with the challenges of the uh, of the changing of the guard, so to speak. That's something that we will definitely continue to address and move forward in the new administration as well. Uh, challenges and opportunities, opportunities too. Um, 
Lou, you mentioned towards the end of your presentation the uh, the complications that arise from the hunting firearm exception. And it reminds me, uh, I think it was just three years ago this month, I think it was December 2017, when uh, Nick Rasmussen, who had just departed uh, uh, the National Counterterrorism Center, where he had served as a director, now serving three years later as the director for GIFT CT, uh, Nick uh, uh, made some press by, by commenting, you know, without trying to get on a Second Amendment issue, that just it's a reality that our, our counterterrorism mission is made more difficult by the fact that bad actors in this country are able to get such easy access uh, to weapons. What types of fixes uh, would you think would be useful uh, to, um, to help get that under control, to make it so that people who are inclined to carry out an act of violent extremism or terrorism have a harder time getting access uh, to a weapon? Well, the, uh... If you're asking my personal opinion, well, for, well first of all, the, the, the example that I um, that I brought up, that needs to be fixed. I mean, that's a loophole. They just need to eliminate that provision. There is no reason that a non-immigrant who comes here on a visitor visa or a student visa needs to go hunt. Or there's no reason that we should be allowing the hunting exception for people to come here and, and hunt in the United States that are, you know, it just, to me, it doesn't make any sense. And that's an easy... Um, that's an easy one to fix legislatively. Um, in terms of, you know, any immigrant getting a firearm, I mean, it should be, it, it should be prohibited. But that, again, that's my personal opinion. It is under 922G, 18 USC 922G. Um, aliens are not supposed to pr um, uh, possess firearms. Uh, but again, with this hunting provision, which, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't help us with these folks being able to get a firearm, which they're supposed to be used for hunting, but it, it, there's nothing in the law that says once they have it, they, they have it, they have to use it for hunting. They have it, you know, it doesn't matter what you're using the weapon for. Um, so if we can get that fixed legislatively, that would be a huge win for us. Yeah, I hear that, I hear that. Um, can you speak for a moment uh, to uh, the, uh, the role of, um, of cybercrime and and the the use of cyber tools in your investigations. So we have a whole cyber division that that uh, works, you know, in conjunction uh, with those type of investigations, and so does the FBI. There's a there is a uh, some of those uh, cybercrime um, investigations are specifically driven there, and if they lead into a counterterrorism investigation, they're brought into the JTF world, but. Um, but I mean, those tools are available to us uh, for for both for any type of investigation, actually. And if if it, if um, you know, the investigation leads to some sort of a terrorism nexus, then of course, then we would you know consult with our partners and bring it into the JTF. You mentioned um, the role of the National Security Unit, uh, and in particular, um, the training component that it provides. Um, what types of training um, does it, is, it, is it important uh, for an HSI agent to get in, in these trainings? What's, what's unique to the type of training that an HSI uh, agent aside to the counterterrorism mission will need to receive? Well, I think it's important to know the historical background of some of these FTOs, what their ideologies are, what makes them think, what makes them tick. It's very important to know these type of things. So when they encounter these folks in the field, what types of questions should they be asking them? You know, what drives these people to do what they do? What would, you know, be a, a good question to ask them to get them to elicit a response that we need in order to pursue a prosecution? So anyway, some of it's cultural. You know, we give training on that. We give, we give training on specific ideologies. You know, what's the difference between Islamism and Islamist? You know, what's the difference between, you know, um, Sunni and Shia? Um, these are important things that, that agents need to know when doing this type of work. Um, that, as well as some of the administrative stuff, too. Like, you know, a, a good example is, is the way we track our statistics, um, you know, 
a lot of attention is given to what we call our significant case reports. If a, if a, if a case becomes a, an SCR, a significant case report, then more funding goes with that case, more attention goes to that case. And it's, 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 uh, those are based on disruption, dismantlement of, of a terrorist cell or organization. So we want all of our cases to, to get to that point, to be an SCR case. And through this training, I mean, when, before we started training these agents, a lot of our uh, counterterrorism investigations weren't going to that level, weren't reaching that level. And, you know, after we train them on exactly what they need to look for, how they need to word the investigations, how they need to provide, um, uh, you know, what, what different things do they need to put in their case in order for it to qualify for that level, um, they've been able to do it. So we saw a dramatic increase in the number of SCRs as a result, as a direct result of this training. Uh, so I think we have time for one last question, um, and uh, let's make it this one. You mentioned that uh, there are certain uh, situations where an immediate action is needed to stop a terrorist threat, and that HSI has some uh, unique authorities uh, when such a circumstance arises. Can you speak to that briefly? Sure. So, you know, we're talking about getting somebody off the street. You know, there are no, we may be following somebody that we know is up to no good, and let's say he's a foreign national and the, you know, we don't have enough probable cause to make a, a criminal arrest, but we want to get this guy off the street. And you got to think of it also from a cost benefit uh, perspective, it costs a lot of money to surveil somebody 24 seven. I think it could some, somewhere up around $10,000 a week to have a surveillance team on somebody 24 seven. It only costs a few hundred dollars a day to keep somebody in custody. So when you, when you weigh those two things um, and we can, uh, based on some sort of an immigration violation, like I said, if he's a foreign national, it's best for us to scoop him up, put him in uh, proceedings. And sometimes uh, we will do that uh, in anticipation of federal criminal charges in the future. Like we don't have enough right now. We're working to that, but the guy's dangerous and we could get him off the street. So we'll, we'll, we'll scoop him up, put him in immigration proceedings and hold him until we can get criminal charges on him. So um, it, it's, it's both a cost-effective uh, way, but it's also a valuable tool. If we have somebody that, you know, there just isn't enough to, to, to do something about this guy, we can at least get him off the street. You know, and, and it goes different ways too. I mean, it, it could be formal like that. We could go through the system. There could also be the, hey, you know, we talked to somebody and we, we know you're up to no good. And it's time for you to go. And we're going to drive you to the airport and we're going to buy you a ticket. You need to go bye bye, and and we do that, and that's not documented, and you don't see that a lot, but that's something that that we can do. And you know, foreign nationals typically are fearful of immigration and the immigration authorities. They they may not care one bit about having to spend a, a couple of days or a couple of weeks in jail, but they're afraid of going back to their countries. So if if you know we can we have that hammer over them and we can arrest them and put them in proceedings either formally or informally like I said, um, that that's a huge huge advantage uh, or tool for us, and we do have the infrastructure in place. I mean you know so we have our 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 sister agency ERO that has the infrastructure for detaining uh, aliens. So when we need to make an arrest like that, we can, and um, you know we could use that tool to to continue detention in certain cir circumstances or go for formal proceedings, um, re remove status if they have status, uh, and then ultimately remove the person. So it's a huge, huge tool for us. Lou, I wanna thank you again very much uh, and your staff made this possible uh, for taking the time today uh, to, uh, to help the public understand the important role that HSI uh, plays uh, in, uh, protecting Americans from the threat of terrorism uh, here at home. Um, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, to talk with us, uh, and uh, we look forward to the continued uh, conversation. Everybody who uh, joined us today, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, especially during this holiday season. Thank you all very, very much. Lou, appreciate it.